another episode of the American Entrepreneur, where we interview entrepreneurs all over the world, but as long as they're looking to build a team, build a business, maybe even develop their own business in the United States, we want to hear their story. What got them into entrepreneurship? Maybe some of the ups and downs they've gone through in their in their path through, uh, you know, path to success. So hopefully you're going to get something from these videos to see that entrepreneurs, no matter what industry they're in, they have something to teach you. And the guest that we have today, his name is Rohan Sheff, and he's actually in Vancouver. And uh, he's he's an entrepreneur. He has a lot to teach us. So I'd like to welcome Rohan Sheff. Thanks a lot for being on this, man. Thanks, Mike, for having me on here. Yeah, I, uh, I came across your profile via Facebook like I have with other uh, entrepreneurs, and it seems like you're into a lot of different things. You've been through some things. So I want to hear your story, man. What got you into entrepreneurship? Because uh, it seems that everybody who kind of fell into the, the path, it's it's sort of a, a roller coaster of events. So what got you uh, into it? Absolutely. Well, my, uh, my me getting into entrepreneurship was kind of a little bit of a fluke. Um, a lot of the times, what I say is I just kind of fell into it by you know by look poker fit the cork it through crook. Um, I went to school to be a commercial airline pilot. Um, as I was going through school to be a commercial airline pilot, I realized you know flying was more of a passion. You know, it didn't, didn't serve a purpose for me. So I kind of realized that, okay, I could, you know, I could do this, and it's something that I've wanted to do since I was two years old, but I didn't see myself becoming a pilot and, you know, flying for an airline and, you know, waking up and traveling 14 hours, 14 days out of the month and all that good stuff. Even though I love traveling, I knew it would ruin that passion. So what I realized was, okay, I need to get out of this. And I looked it up, and I was like, okay, what, is, what are some other careers that I can go into uh, that will make just as good money as being a pilot? Because we all know pilots make these pretty damn good money these days. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, just as good money as being a pilot, but also, you know, have control over my life. And I searched it up and uh, there was one, it was the top three things. The first two I'm not going to mention on here because they were very inappropriate. Um, the third one, <laughs> the third, yeah, the first one was drug dealing. The second one was being a hooker. Literally. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. I don't even know what blog article I was reading, but it was hilarious. Well, the third thing caught my eye and it was sales, right? Um, so when I was like, okay, I got to get into sales. Okay, let's see it. I've always, and it's funny because you know, thinking back through high school days and everything else, I've always kind of been an entrepreneur, but not actually didn't act, didn't even know what it meant. I was importing stuff from China back when I was like grade nine, grade ten, and selling it all through my schools, making really good money is for like a 14, 15 year old, you know, that you wouldn't even expect to be making. And it was just something that kind of happened. Um, I got into sales. I got into door-to-door -door sales actually in uh, about nine years ago. Now we're coming up on door-to-door. -door. I've, I've been in door-to-door. -door. It's a tough business, but it teaches you so much. So it, much. Def it definitely, definitely does. So I did, got into door-to-door -door, uh, sales, and I was like, you know what? If there's anything out there that's going to teach me more of a sales experience, is this. Um, so I took on the job, and I took, and I, you know, initially failed at it. Absolutely, hor like hor horrendously failed at it. Uh, three weeks in, like, didn't even have one sale. Almost got fired from my job. Boss came to me and goes, "I'm going to give you a couple of days. You got to figure your shit out. Get a sale, or else I got to get rid of you." What, you know, what were you selling? I was at that point I was selling. Is this when the deregulated gas was becoming this big thing? Yeah, electricity and gas. I got you. Well, okay. Yeah, electricity and gas. I was selling deregulated gas and just coming to BC and I was taking on. I was just working for a company. I was selling that. You know, um, as soon as I kind of got that fire under my ass, saying I was going to be fired, and I'm the kind of guy that I do not give up on anything. So I'm very, very, you know, persistent in that way. I made sure I got the sale to keep myself buy me another week at the job. You know, kept doing what I needed to do to buy myself time. Eventually, you know, it came to a point where I was one of the top performers in the company. Uh, Canada wide, yeah. Um, that you know had a decent tenure to itself, and then once I was done there, I was like, okay, there's got to be something bigger and better that I can expand my skill door to door. You know, once you once you get to, once you get to learn a skill of sales of where you show up at someone's door and they're not expecting to be sold and you can sell them, that's a skill that you know most people don't have in, in any sales business out there. Uh, took that and when I went into a company where I was selling in home, so I'd come into someone's house and they were like our call center would call them, set up an appointment. We were selling software for their kids to help them through school. So kind of like a Kumon or like a Sylvan learning or, or something like that. You get, you know, we all have in North America, but it was in home and these guys weren't expecting to be sold. They were just more expecting to have like a, um, presentation, what, what, a presentation or consultation is what we called yeah, it back then. I've been in that uh, too. I mean, that's beautiful. Yes, right? Where you right? basically, it's a, it's sort of a quote unquote warm lead because it's not like you're just meeting for them for the first time. But whenever you do talk to them, they don't expect to actually pull out their wallet and give you a credit no, card. No, yes. not at all. Benefit. So we had two and a half, we had two and a half hours of a, of a scheduled session to you know come in, do a consultation, um, evaluate the children, see how they were doing in school. And it was a legit presentation. Uh, there was a ton of value in it. But within that two hours, it was set up to sell a $6,500 product. Wow. 
dollars. $6,500. Okay. So six, if six. you were, were you a hundred percent commission at this time? A hundred percent commission. Every sales job I've ever done was a hundred percent commission because if I ever took, I took out one sales job for about three months. I remember that had a salary base to it and I never, ever actually took it seriously because I was always banking on the money that I knew was going to come into the bank every two weeks. Oh yeah. So you kind of go easy then, right? It's just, yeah, like, you just you, float. There's no right. motivation, right? I've, right. I've, I've been in that situation where if you are a hundred percent commission, you, you, you're, you're hungrier. And I believe you push way harder than the people who are not. Absolutely. You push way, way harder because you know, you, you, you at the end of the day determine your paycheck and what you're going to make at the end of the month. Right. And, so, and, and, and I guess every lead pretty much is basically the exact same. It's not like you can get a, a warmer lead than the other salesperson that's on your force where it's not like, uh, there's the career company politics that's being played from, you know, not, salesmen that are in the company a little longer than you are basically. Is that yeah, not, you? not at all. I came in, it's funny cause I came in about two and a half years into the company uh, and they had already had a very strong sales team. So I was already coming in as an underdog um, and, you know, coming in to prove myself in the first month there, I was top three in sales. Um, I was one of the first few, few people that with the first day out, like we had a, I have the, 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 uh, script for it somewhere cause we had to memorize a full script. It was like a 42 page script that we had to word for word memorize before we went out and we could actually make it our own. And uh, I came in as an underdog. Uh, I was one of the first, the, my very first sale, I sold them. Um, and then from there, you know, it was just building the value, building the presentations. And it literally, like you said, you know, there was never a lead that was never different. Because yes, every family situation may have been different, but you, as long as you understood how to pertain the value and give the value so that they saw the product that we were offering, you would sell them. Whether they, you know, whether they were multimillionaires or whether they were just about putting food on the table, at the end of the day, everybody wants the number one thing, and that's the best for the children. So that's right. kind of how we did. That's kind of how we did tailor the, uh, the 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 pitch based around that, and uh, did very very well at twenty. Did you believe in the product? I believe in the I believe in the product 100. Very good. 100. That's a, that's a 100. big piece to, to entrepreneurship and to sales. As long as you believe in what you're selling, I think. Really I, yeah, product. it's funny because I believe in that product more than I believe in the product when I'm selling door to door sales. <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is, you know. Yeah. We, we all we all learn somewhere somehow. So yeah, I did believe in the product phenomenally and had a phenomenal tenure with that company. Um, you know, did really, really well for 22 years at 21, 22 when I was working for them, making multiple six figures at that point in time. Um, and yeah, and at that, at that time kind of, you know, it came to a point again where I was just like, I, I always want to learn and I'm always kind of seeing, okay, what can I do to take my skill to another level? And I knew at this point mentally, I was just like, yeah, okay, go and do probably like some higher end corporate sales or software sales. Or, you know, go and maybe even do like time shows because obviously that's another whole game of sales. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that I would still be in that, you know, you work from the 1st to the 31st and then you start over at the 1st every single month. It's just kind of like real estate or whatever, any sales gig. Uh, and I was like, hey, there's got to be something else of sales that comes from it that, you know, that is another level to it. And I realized that marketing was what it was because when you're marketing, you're marketing not to the one person, you're marketing to the masses and you're getting them to understand what your product is all about. And then, and then building a story, building the sales that are all that stuff, building a funnel to sell them your product. Uh, I started studying marketing, started, you know, reading a ton of books and everything else and realized, you know, digital marketing was this big platform that was just coming out as a career, as a profession, whatever you want to call it. And I started investing a ton. I remember I, my, the very first course that I invested in was $5,000 for a mastermind that I had to fly to. I literally flew to LA for three days to learn uh, from some of the biggest marketers at that point in time. And this is going back like 2006, 2007. Wow. Uh, and how old are you right now? How old are you right I'm now? I'm 27. 27. Wow, man, yeah. you were young yeah. and doing this. You're 20. That had to be what? Is that 2007? So you're talking. So about 2008. Remember 2008? No, 2008. Let me figure out the numbers here. So I'm 27 now. Let's rewind. We were 2008 is when I did door to door. 2009, 2010 is when I did the in home. So 2011 is when I would have done. Is when sorry, yeah, 2011. 22 years old. 22 years yeah. old you, you you put down five grand to go out to, five to, to LA. Five grand. I was the youngest kid in the entire room. I was the youngest kid in the entire room. Good for you, 2011. Man. Good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so flew out. You know, showed up there. You know, once again, the youngest kid in the room. Every single time I end up somewhere, the one thing I've always realized is if you're the youngest and the dumbest in the room, you're doing something right. You know, Napoleon Hill's exactly. talked about that. There are multiple if mentors. You're the, that in, you're the smartest person in the room. You're doing something wrong. Completely wrong. Um, and I loved it. And I got, showed up there, learned the traffic strategies, and you know, that's something that I always understood because of, you know, when you come from a door to door background, traffic is the number one thing. And this was a traffic mastermind that I put myself into for five grand. 
and you know law of averages everything else that i'd learned over the years came into marketing and i was like wow this is like this is revolutionary in my mind at that point in time and came back and kind of just started learning putting more and more efforts and you know doing some affiliate work by myself um and while i was getting good success with digital marketing i was still working for the sales company one thing led to another you know i had small companies like just family friend companies just asked me oh what, what should i do with facebook ads or what should i do with google ads and started to realize that okay there's a market for consulting with businesses with what I know. And then that's when I started my consulting company and I've been doing that now absolutely, you know, having phenomenal success with it. Uh, managing half a million dollars a month in Facebook ads, a few hundred thousand dollars a month in Google ads, plus across uh, other plat other paid uh, platforms. So currently today what I do is I have a business partner of mine, the two of us run a marketing company that we specialize in traffic. Uh, for small, for medium and large size businesses, and we work with some of the some of the biggest brands out there. And so you work with, you said Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the social media sites. Is that is that how you? Ev everything, yeah. Facebook's majority right now because Facebook is the mecca in a lot of people's eyes, you know, um, for marketing and the way that you know, the databases and everything that they have. So we do a ton of it on there. But you know, we spent like like I said, about half a million dollars a month, give or take, per month. Majority of the times, is more than half a million on Facebook ads. Google ads are spending a few hundred thousand. Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. You know, Outbrain, Taboola, anything out, anything within the paid platform of traffic on the internet, we're spending a ton of money on it right now. Okay, so depending on the business that you deal with, you figure out a best strategy, right? It's, it's absolutely if it's. If it's uh um, I guess if you're if it's a corporation that's looking for to hire somebody, you're obviously yep. going to spend a lot of money and pay advertising in LinkedIn, right? Absolutely. And then Absolutely. so so let's just say it's a medium sized business that's trying to promote a product, not a service. Do you just do Facebook and you target ads in that zip code? Is that majority of the time? Yeah, majority. Of the, even even with corporations, a lot of the times right now, Facebook is converting really really well. So we are doing like a 60 40 split or something 30 70 30 split on Facebook versus LinkedIn because LinkedIn is pretty expensive. Uh, for a lot of the medium-sized companies, but then when, you get, when we get into a larger end corporations that we work with, they have the budgets, they have the deep pockets, so then we do you know 50-50 split, or if they want to really go after LinkedIn and that's like, the thing that they want to do, then we'll spend the majority of the budget on LinkedIn. Gotcha, so it's your job to figure out a strategy, present to them and say, here's how much it's gonna cost that. Absolutely, that's exactly and, it. And then how about, let's just say media, actually pro being the creative behind it all, where it's the videos and whatnot, do you d assemble, we just, who does that? So we've got a yeah, so we've got a team of eleven guys that work for us right now. Um, everything from you know strategic from strategic marketers to copywriters to, to video uh, videographers. As a matter of fact, I've got a full time videographer starting working for for me um, in January. He's going to follow me around and kind of document everything because I'm going to start a YouTube channel and start documenting everything that we've ever done. That's uh, awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, we've got everything. So you know, a lot of the my passion and what I do with the company now is just sitting down with the client and figuring out a game plan that's going to have them the best success. Whether it's a six month contract, twelve month contract, however they want to work with us, or if they just want to do something where you can put together a plan and let's kind of game plan towards it and work towards it. And then we and then I find out hey, we put together okay, if you want to you know if they're let's say an e-commerce company that we work with, we'll say okay, Facebook is going to be your platform. Now with within Facebook, let's reverse engineer a 12 month goal and say, okay, if, if we wanna hit this in 12 months, what do we need to do in month 11, 10, 9, 8, and then kind of work all the way backwards and then we put that full plan together and then my team goes and executes on it. And, and that's what I've, I've realized with, I, I did a lot of work with small businesses. Now, mm -hmm. it seems like with advertising in general, it takes a long time. Now the patience that a business owner needs in order to see an actual result from advertising on social media, they're going to need a lot of it. So is it difficult to explain to them, hey, you, you, what you're looking for may take two years to, to see those results. So <coughs> in order, it, it almost comes off as, um, you know, it's a difficult approach with these business owners, depending on the size of the business, to say, hey, you're going to have to do this consistently, religiously for two years straight and that's when you're gonna see the results. Is that a difficult sell, or do you see results much faster than ever expected? Well, every client's different. Um, if I, I've run into situations where you know you know it's gonna take 12 to 24 months sometimes to see based on, based on the marketing plan we put together. However, if we're going for something like a direct response marketing plan, the goal is to get them a result within 90 to 120 days. You know, whether it's one, whether we're just breaking even or something that they know they're they're seeing an ROI coming back on it, and then we just got to figure out the scale and go from it. Um, every conversation is different. So yes, I've had that conversation, and it is. And to any business owner, it is difficult to realize you're investing this kind of money with no guaranteed results because it's marketing at the end of the day. Right. However, the goal is to get you guaranteed results. To, to meet with the clients, do you meet 
via Skype? Do you meet in person? Do you focus on a certain area? Are you all over the map? Are you all over? I've the got world? I've got clients all over the world. I've wow. got clients in Canada, United States, UK, Australia, Asia, um, United Kingdom, all over, literally all. I guess I've already said UK, all over the world. Um, and you know, I, depend depending on the style and what we're doing for the client. Majority of the time, interactions usually Skype because that's the easiest way to communicate today. Uh, just like you and I are communicating right now, and it's you know it feels like you're sitting across the table from someone. Exactly. Uh, but sometimes you know it does take me getting on a flight and getting over to the other part of the world or getting over the pond and go talking to them in person because sometimes you know the client just wants that handshake deal where they say okay you know let's meet in person and shake on it like like true old gentlemen. Exactly. Now, how yeah. do you find your clients? Is it more word of mouth? <clears throat> are you cold calling? Is it is it some of the things you're doing with SEO and your own Facebook advertising that's finding? These people are, let me just say, maybe them finding you. Funny enough, um, our, our marketing style is a little bit different than most other smaller boutique agencies. Um, a lot of what we've done over the, over the years, LinkedIn was one of our biggest heavy hitters that got us going, uh, reaching out and doing, doing a full-blown LinkedIn strategy that kind of helped us get, our, get us uh, on our feet. But today, it's literally 99% referrals. Wow. And I've noticed that with all small businesses since I've been working with them about yeah. eight and a half years. It seems like any business that actually gets going, it all comes back to word of mouth rather than yeah. TV advertising, which I've spent a lot of money on and wasted, and radio advertising, even social media to a point. Word of mouth is really the biggest biggest key to a small business and, and medium sized business to grow, I think. So Absolutely. And you know, I yeah, I do say ninety nine percent of our, our inbound business is referrals. But we are still actively marketing because we are actively testing everything else. So, you know, we'll still get the odd client once a month or every other month from Facebook or LinkedIn. But just some of our heavy hitter clients that we do have and big names that I can't talk about due to NDAs, majority of the big ones that we work with, with that, that, you know, that count for majority of the ads that we manage for are referrals. Okay, so the people, the businesses that you're looking for, for as your clients or mm -hmm. individuals even, What's the criteria? Budget per month? What? G give me who? Who's your exact target audience? Who is your customer? Now, my exact target audience is anyone that's doing over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in gross revenue. Um, that's on a smaller scale. That's as low as we'll go. Um, and then from there, we can take because they want to. They're two hundred fifty thousand. They want to scale to you know three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, a million. We'll take them on, um, and then for some of the other bigger brands that we work with, they need to come in with a minimum twenty-five thousand dollar a month ad spend to work with us. So it's 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 a little bit two different target audiences within that realm. Uh, but because we some of the brands that come to us and ask us, you know, if they come with a five or ten thousand dollar a month uh, budget, we know we can't work with them. However, if they come with the twenty-five or higher, then we know we can work with those brands. So the people who are watching these videos, they're either aspiring entrepreneurs or they're startup entrepreneurs. So what would you say to them as one of the more difficult things that you've overcome in your startup phases of your entrepreneurship or even what would you say to them to say, to tell them like to stay away from this or to do this? Give, give me a couple of pieces of information that you picked up along the way. Um, one of the biggest things that I would probably tell, and I do this with a lot of my coaching clients, is you know when we're starting up, we're always just hungry to take the whatever deal comes into our plate. Um, and I don't get me wrong, I did that. I took anything and everything that I could when I was first starting because I had to put food on the table. Um, however, if you're gonna be if you're gonna get into entrepreneurship and you're gonna be committed to it, you gotta come from a standpoint of con you know confidence and conviction. If you're gonna take anything and everything that comes to your plate, you're gonna literally turn away the ideal client you'd want to work with. And the day I actually understood that was, you know, stand for what I stand for, the clients that I work with will come to me. And that's literally was a transformational change in my entire company because I went from chasing business to business chasing me. Wow. Okay. So and I agree with that because you know <clears throat> people always think of, okay, well I can make that first five hundred bucks or a thousand dollars, but you're handcuffing yourself to this bloodline that technically is going to actually hurt you in the long run. You're going to be doing something for a lot less money or you're going to be providing a service that's not even worth that $500,000. So you're not going to even do it a great job at it. No, and, the, and if you're taking something on on the lower end, you got to think of the mindset of the client too. Um, and don't get me wrong, I have a ton of respect for smaller level clients because you know we're all that we all come from that space. However, the smaller level clients is better off learning how to do it themselves 
so they understand what to do when it comes to, you know, it's just the reverse psychology of the e-myth. Michael Gerber talks about it. Initially, you're working in your business, but the goal is to work on your business. And if you come in and you say, okay, give me 500 bucks a month to handle it, you may have just taken the last 500 bucks that that business needed to put the lights on for the next month. And if you did not get the success that, the, that you claimed to you could get them just because you wanted that 500 bucks, now you could have not only screwed your business, but you could have screwed theirs as well. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. I, you, you, it's tough to, to think from that angle where it's basically you're always just trying to provide a great value, great service. But the different price points you set, people you go after, that could be something that is so important to them that if you do screw up or let's just say it takes a little, maybe you don't even screw up. It just takes a little longer than expected. You yeah. look like the bad guy. And guess what? Two people are now hurt, which now you're not getting the word of mouth uh, advertising that you really want. No. And if you really wanted to help them. And you know it's 500 bucks, help them for free, and then I can guarantee you they'll know someone that is your ideal client that they'll refer you to. Mm, very good. I like that. I like that. But like, there's still today's day and age, like, I still have a ton of people that will reach out to me and say, hey, can you take us on? And I look at them as a company and I say, there's no way. I, I would just internally, to my integrity, I would not be able to take them on because I know if I did, and it, it took, like you said, it took, you know, if they were expecting results in 60, but it took 120 days. I know I don't have an extra 60 days in the back end of that. I would rather say, hey, listen, I'll give you an hour's worth of my time. Let's jump on Skype. I'll put together a plan. Go do this. You know, you can learn how to run a Facebook ad to its basic aspect, not the way we do it, but to its basic aspect to get you enough results by yourself on YouTube.com. Go learn how to do that. Put this plan together. And then once you have a little bit of success and you know you've got a little bit more gross income or net income that you can you can you can justify spending on an agency, then we can have that conversation. And if you come from that, because now what you've done is you've done you've done it through value, you've done it through giving back. Ninety nine percent of the time, if any other agency down the road tries to approach them, they're never gonna they're never gonna want to work with them. They're always gonna want to come back with you because you were the one that provided it. Exactly. And I do that. And I do that probably at least a couple times a week still. Yeah, I. Yeah, it's it's something that's a difficult lesson to learn early on, but you have, to give, you have to give so much more value than you ever expect before you could even ask for a dollar. I always think that. Uh, I learned that the hard way. You go out to a, a meeting as a startup business, they never heard of you, the product, the service, anything, the business, and you're expected to get paid that day. It doesn't happen. So no. you have to give a ton of value before you can even ask for that dollar, and that's going to live on. So. Absolutely. And there comes a point, there comes a point where, where, you know, your credibility will stand for its value and that's when clients will start paying you at the beginning before you even take them on. But it takes a while to build that credibility, build yourself to be looked at as like a value driven proposition to that company. But you got to start by giving first, then it'll all come back to you. Yeah, I'm a big believer in credibility and positioning. Positioning yeah. is something you have to really focus on where you want to position yourself in the market or in your in your group of, of friends or family or business owners that you're the go-to guy for this thing. You're the expert, maybe not even the expert, but the person that I'm going to ask for this advice. Position. Absolutely, absolutely. Are you a big reader? Do you read a lot of books? I read a ton. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy I consume one audiobook a week. Yeah, and we do a book club, uh, we yeah. do a book a week. We're, I consume one audiobook a week and I'm usually my goal, um, I did pretty well, my goal this year was to read, read physically read a book a week uh, still getting quite, still getting pretty good at it, but you know there's some weeks depending on the size of the book. I'll read a book, but usually about I'll read about two and a half books a month. What's the like last physically? Book? What's the last book you read? Uh, the one I just finished was the One Thing, and the one right before that was you know the uh, Ask Gary V book. Yes, we all nice. The, the, his yeah. newest one. The newest, the newest one? one. Yeah, I yeah. got I got to read that. I that and uh, obviously a Cardone. I'm a big fan of both of those guys. So. Oh, okay. I've got every single Cardone book. I bought. Uh, you know, be obsessed to be average right when it came out, and I powered through that as fast as I could. <laughs> Is it worth it? Though? It's it's worth it. It's worth it. Also, I still gotta tell Grant. You know, uh, whenever I see him, 10x rule and seller be sold are two of my favorite books he ever came out with. But you know, no matter what, as long as you find one thing within each book that you know, they change yourself or change your business, that's all that matters. Yeah, you got to check out a book I'm reading now. I'm falling in love with it. It's called The Winner's Brain. So um, The Winner's uh, Brain. The Winner's Definitely. Brain. Take a look at that. It's pretty incredible. So, all right. So here's another question for you. Five years from now, <coughs> Rohan Sheth will be doing what? Five years from now, my, uh, it's funny because I tell this to a lot of people. My goal is to be acquired by VaynerMedia. Well, really? That's, are yeah. you serious? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's, That's my work. business partner and I. Gary. Gary yeah. Gary. So oh, I'm a huge, huge, huge Gary Vaynerchuk. I've seen him speak four times. I'll be seeing him speak in Vancouver in March. Um, and I will make sure that he knows it. You know, like his goal is to be, to buy the, to buy. Yes. 
the Jets. New York Jets. Yeah. Uh, and my goal is to be acquired by Vayner Media because I've seen him acquire a bunch of agencies over the last little bit, and I've kind of reverse engineered what he's the what he's done with those agencies. And now my business partner and I have a plan to get to our agency at that point. So that you know, hey, with if we do get acquired by Vayner Media, great. But I know for a fact at some point Gary V will know that we're going to be a runner right against him. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause I, one of the things I, I do motivational speeches and whatnot. And, uh, and I talk to people, I always ask them, if you don't know who you are, write down your dream obituary. How do you want to be remembered? And it, it seems like what you just talked about there, reverse engineering, I, you know, it just goes back to think of something and then work your way backwards. Exactly. And then if you're not doing that to lead to that end goal, then you got to yeah. change something. So yeah. figure out how you got to do that. And you're reverse engineering how to get acquired. So, you're doing yeah. something right there, man. That's that's pretty much it. And the end goal, you know, that's that's just a five year end goal for us is to get acquired at some point. And then, you know, you never know where we end up in business at that point. Maybe, you know, work in a partnership with him or something like that, but we'll see where, where life takes us. But that's and that's you know the one goal, the one thing that I will but you know, even though I've just finished ironic just finished reading that book and that's all they talk about is focus on the one thing, but that has always been the one thing that I've always wanted to work towards and I've always had one big goal and chasing it. Now that we know that that's what we want, there's nothing else that can come in our way. Another question for you. The greatest part about being an entrepreneur is what? The great, the greatest part about being an entrepreneur is the lessons you learn on a daily basis. Damn right, for sure, man. You can apply it to every part of your bit, every part of your life. Hundred percent. Relationships. Uh, any time in the economy, you can understand what's good for you and what's not good for you. Uh, relationships with your friends, family, anything. I believe you can take every lesson you learn in business and apply it to something else that day in some other part of your life, and Without a doubt. it's gonna be a good thing. Without a doubt, there's no other, like I say, you know, when people ask me, how did you get into business or did you go to get an MBA? No, nope, I got the school of hard knocks and that's all I needed. <laughs> yeah. I saw that on your Facebook, by the way, school of hard yeah, knocks. Yeah, school of hard knocks. I went to a real estate seminar one time and this is when I was 22 years old, right before I bought my first rental property. And nice. uh, he said, he's like, you're not going to take this class and <coughs> 10 grand to this? I'm like, nah, I think I'll figure it out. He goes, hey, you got to go through the school of hard knocks. I, I didn't really get it at first, but now I did because who, who, who was the who was the course through? It was through uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad Kiyosaki. Rich, yeah, Kiyosaki Group. Okay, nice. Yeah, so it was That's a good group. Nice. I mean, they taught us a lot in those three day seminars, which were for free. But yeah. then you had to pay ten grand to have the, or it was even more than that to have like the uh, the mentorship program. I yeah. guess you call it. Yeah, but, but we it do. Good. We, it was good stuff. Yeah, we do a ton, a ton of work in the event space and the, the Kiyosaki group. Robert Allen, actually, multiple streams of income. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's one of our really, really good clients that we work with. Wow, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Man. yeah. Now, if anybody were here to, to reach out to you, maybe either an uh, aspiring entrepreneur or a business, how would they reach you? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, website, how can they reach uh, you? Instagram's going to be your best bet because that's my most active right now. So it's just Rohan underscore chef or Snapchat. Same thing, Rohan underscore chef. Um, and if you just find me on Facebook and friend me, I'll more than likely accept your friend request. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, what you're telling me, man, is I, it was difficult to get you on because you're so busy, it seems like. So I'm so happy that we finally got it done even before the holiday. So thank you so much for doing this, man. And if it's okay, maybe early 2017 or sometime next year, we get together and do another interview to hear your progress. Let's, let, yeah, definitely. Let's do, you know, maybe we can do it in, while well, we be traveling and speaking all of January and into February, but uh, middle of February, once I'm back in Vancouver, we definitely can jump back on this for sure. Beautiful. That works, man. Uh, and you seem like a hell of a guy who knows his stuff, so I'll be contacting you <laughs> afterwards regardless, man, okay? Let's do it. Cool, man. Well, thanks, guys, for tuning in to another episode of The American Entrepreneur. But we interview entrepreneurs all over the world. So if you have a story to tell and maybe you have something you've learned along the way that others can take with them in their own journey, we want to hear it. Remember, guys, The American Entrepreneur will always create more. Thanks, guys.